Good morning. I will say it, it's, a, uh, it's a joy to be here with you, and uh, I, I thank the Lord for his faithfulness throughout the years. I, uh, as Pastor Roger says, uh, I cannot come here without uh, reminiscing. You always, uh, uh, you always think of uh, how quick life goes by, really. And, uh, you know, I, I, holding forth the, the word of life as you have this immense missions emphasis week, um, Missions has always been a part of this lo local congregation. I know that was part of Pastor Bill's, Bill's heart as, uh, you know, he started the work. And, you know, we just, you know, as, as the Lord works in our hearts and in our lives, um, he carries forth his plan throughout the centuries. And, you know, you think of those people that you serve with who are with the Lord now. And, uh, you know, you, you, you greatly thank God for the opportunity and the impact that they had on your life, and, and then you, you thank God for those that are here continuing the work, and, and uh, certainly I, I, I can promise you that I will always uh, covet you and co pray for you and, and hold you before the throne of grace, and, and uh, we uh, just thank the Lord for His work in, in each one of our lives. I am excited for your mission's emphasis. I, I'm glad I get to preach before Jason. Um, you, you, it, it'll get better from here, I promise you. Um, uh, Pastor Jason's uh, been a great blessing to, to our heart and life. And then uh, I think somewhere along the way you're going to hear Dr. Anderson. And uh, he's, he's always been a great, great influence. And, and uh, I, uh, I, just a man greatly used by God. That's the only way I can, I, I can tell you uh, from what I've seen in his life and in his ministry and the work there at Appalachian Bible College. Open your Bibles, if you would, this morning to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And when Pastor Roger shared with me the, the emphasis on missions this month, my, my heart immediately went to this particular passage of Scripture. When you read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and it's hard when you just come in and, and uh, you know, you're not preaching through the book. Um, you're, you're coming in the middle of it. But as you read the book of 2 Corinthians, always keep in mind that the Apostle Paul was defending his ministry. There were those who were attacking him. Um, there were those who were making accusations ag against his ministry. And um, trying to, you know, if, uh, we, we always say it this way, if you don't like the message, what do you do? You attack the messenger, and uh, we, we see that throughout the, the scriptures, and we see that in, in, in Paul's life. So as Paul um, replies to, to the, the accusations against him, he actually just really gives us his motives for ministry. And uh, I, I cannot think of a better way when you think about missions is to, to begin with asking yourself the question, and I would encourage each of you to ask the question to yourself here this morning, and believe me, I've asked the question uh, a number of times as I've studied, particularly in, in the last couple of weeks, why do we do what we do? You know, why do we have an emphasis of missions? Why do we, and, and not really a motive for missions, but really a motive for life, a motive for, for service? I think everyone here would agree with me that, that you could say that God saves you for a purpose. And the Apostle Paul understood that. And as he shares his motives, I pray that you will take this opportunity to, to look into your own heart and, and your own life and really evaluate, you know, what is missions and the spreading of the gospel really all about? Because in the society in which we live, sometimes it can, it can, get, it can get so distorted. Um, and, and as I say that, it's not, it's not a, I always want to be careful because in my older age, I will, I will tell you this, that I have changed some, okay? I know you can't believe that, but I, 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 have, I have changed some. Um, if there's a voice, if you hear a loud baby cry in here, there's probably a 70% chance it's part of my, one of my family members. Um, but, but uh, you know, over time, you know, by God's grace and God's wisdom, um, you understand that God uses different people different ways. Okay? And as, as we say that, we never compromise the message of the gospel. 
We, we never compromise that message. And Paul never compromised that message. So as we look at this passage today and we look at these motives for missions or these motives for service or motives for Paul's life, I pray that God will use them greatly to encourage us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11 says this, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But we... But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you a cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is passed away. Behold, the new has come. Let's pray. Father, as we look into your word this morning, I pray that the Spirit of God would just use us for your honor and for your glory. Father, we thank you for the scripture. We thank you for its authority. We thank you for the testimony of the Apostle Paul in his service. And Lord, as we look at his life and as we look at his motives this morning, we pray that it would be a constant reminder to our lives, Lord, that we would live for your glory and your glory alone. For it's in Jesus' name I ask these things. Amen. In any ministry, uh, we know we, we face opposition at times. Many times we allow, I don't know about you, but many times we allow that opposition to discourage us. Ever been there? And it's, it's, it's easy. It's easy to become discouraged from what people say. Jesus, I think, prepared the disciples for that. And in John chapter 15, he reminds them, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would have loved you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I say to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecute me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. Christ faced that opposition in his earthly ministry. You know that is you, all you got to do is read the Gospels and you see how from the religious crowd, Christ faced opposition. The Apostle Paul faced that opposition. You know, when you think about all the things that Paul went through, and, and let me tell you, if, if you read 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and you look at all that Paul went through and you, you wrote that as a job description, not too many people would want to sign up for that job. Whip, scurred. Shipwrecked, snake bitten, stoned, left for dead. I mean, it, it goes on and on. Imprisoned. And, and I might add this imprisoned for doing what was right and God honoring. And yet, he remained faithful to the truth of the scripture. And as he see us, starts here, he. The first motive we see here, you, you see in the passage, it starts out with therefore. Now, we're going back way from things you, you remember, or I remember Pastor Bill saying from a long time ago. What's the therefore? Therefore. And, and let me encourage you. In this section of scripture that I read today, you will see a number of therefores. It's, it's a very progressive thought. Okay? 
So the first therefore, it says, Paul says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord. And I think that we see first motive that Paul has is represented by that first therefore. Um, some of the translations, rather than fear, if you, if, you, if you have a King James translation, an authorized version, you'll see the word used as the word terror. But I, I, I believe this translation is a better translation of it. It, it, it really means a fear or a reverence or an awe for the Lord. And if you look in the context, if you look, read verse 10, just previous verse here, it's a very sobering fact that one day every believer will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And, and, and that, that should be an awe-inspiring thing to our lives, knowing that I will give an account to the Lord, not for my sin, praise God, that's covered by the cross, right? But I will give an account for my life. I will give an account, and, and this is very sobering to me, I will give an account for what I do in this body that the Lord has given me to serve Him. So Paul begins by saying, therefore knowing, you know, he, he understands. He's not walking in ignorance. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. And it's interesting, the word persuade, because a lot, a lot of times when we look at this word persuade, because of the loss of language or differences in language, we can say, oh yeah, Paul's trying to maneuver, to manipulate, to try to get men to see things his way. And that's not what he's saying at all. In fact, it's uh, one other time that, that we see um, this used in the Scripture. Turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter 1 for a moment. Galatians chapter 1. Notice what he says in verse 10. Galatians 1.10. Paul says this, For I am now seeking the approval, or for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul is not trying to manipulate. He is trying to live his life in a favorable way in which his testimony, his integrity, his life is represented of Christ in the ministry. And so as he's talking about this, this persuasion of men, understand he's not looking for the key to their heart, trying to turn it. He is clearly living his life in a favorable way that the message of the gospel may go forth. And beloved, I pray that understanding in our lives, understanding that one day, very soon, we will give an account to the Lord that we will be motivated to live our lives in a way that honors Him and that the conduct of our ministry would never bring question and be favorable in the sight of those that we serve. One of the things, that, and Pastor Roger shared, one of the ministries that the Lord has allowed me to be involved in, and I thank the Lord for it every day, is, is the chaplain ministry with the military. Yes, it happens almost weekly, but it happened even yesterday. <clears throat> I walked into an office, and, and, it, and, and it was a, a, a female. Not that that makes it any different, but it was a female. And probably the first or third word out of her mouth was something that you wouldn't hear me say from the pulpit. How's that? And immediately she stopped and said, sorry, chaplain. And, and I, I always say this. You never give an account to me because you don't. But one day, I always include this part too, but one day, every one of us will give an account to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. Now, it used to, it, sometimes it bothers me that, that they think they answer to me, but I pray that it's a good thing that I live my life and my ministry in such a way that it represents Christ and that I have a favorable ear to share with them the message of the gospel. 
knowing that, again, keeping that in mind, that one day I will give an account. So knowing the fear of the Lord, Paul says, we persuade men. Paul is not afraid of the Lord, but he does have a reverential awe for him and recognizes that his whole life and his whole ministry comes under this God's scrutiny. It is that awareness that motivates him to persuade men. As we see about this, he understands also that it's a reflection of his testimony. What seems to be indicated in the use of the verb persuasion is the fact that he's not going to compromise the message of the gospel that it would be pleasing to his hearers. We know that the gospel message will not always be received. But it doesn't mean that we can change it. It doesn't mean that it is a message that can be compromised in any way, shape, or form. You know, we, we talk about, I, I, I always remember growing up, I always heard messages, or not always heard messages, but people would talk about peer pressure. And they always talked about peer pressure like it was just something that only a young person faces. Now, if you're a young person here, next time someone does this, I'm giving you ammunition. Okay? If we're honest, we understand that we all face peer pressure. And it can, it can have an effect upon us if we allow it. Paul says, do I seek to please God or do I seek to please man? It's that reverential awe. It's that worship that motivated Paul to live his life, to persuade others, to be seen in a favorable manner so that he could share the gospel. And then he understood that his testimony had an impact. Notice the second part of verse 11. He says, but what we are is known to God, and I hope it is also to your conscience. Paul wanted people to understand that God knows his heart. How about you, but some of the, the greatest consolation I have as I lay down and go to sleep at night is knowing that, God, you know my heart. You know my heart. You see, as Paul, and, and never lose sight of this in the defense of his ministry, Paul's going to, and I, it's hard not to jump ahead when you are studying and study, but, but Paul understands that there are those who are ridiculing him that really just like to put on a show. They like to boast about their ancestry or particularly in this letter, maybe their spiritual gift. But Paul understands that whatever he does, God knows. God knows. And I would say to you, beloved, this morning, whatever motive you have in the ministry of missions, please understand God knows. God knows your heart. And Paul wanted to make sure that he let them know that God knows his heart and also he hoped it is known also to your conscience. You see, Paul, I think Paul was wanting the believers there to be the ones who would also represent his integrity, who would also verify and validate the ministry of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to those who would render opposition. It's easy to say that God knows, right? You know, we, can, we, can, we can face a lot of situations and say, well, God knows, right? But Paul wanted them also to have participation. He wanted them to understand 
and he hoped that it was clear in their conscience the importance of the motivation of the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who have not heard. And Paul lived his life for that reason. And beloved, that's what it's all about. Verse 12. I must move on. We are not commending ourselves to you again. <laughs> you know, if you commend yourself again, I, I, anytime I read this verse, I think of this. Um, sometimes we really say stupid things. <laughs> you ever been there? Here's one, of the, here's, here's one of my top ten. Not that that's important. But when you, when you think about trying to justify what you do to people who are opposing you, 90% of the time, it's just going to give them more ammunition. It is. I had this come into life in my life and ministry at a very young age. One of the, one of the things I was able to do was uh, coach. I, I was able to coach soccer in a Christian school where I taught Bible and math just out of Bible college. I remember one day I had two boys who got into a fight with each other, and I made them, the whole practice, I made them run and touch the poles, the goalposts, 100 and some yards, 110 yards, you know. By the time they were done, they were too tired. They weren't going to fight each other, you know. But there was a, there was a teacher there at the school who wrote an article for the newspaper. And uh, I, I don't know what his, his reason, I don't know his motive. But he wrote an article, and, he, and in his article, he talked about three different coaches in town and, and gave the impression that these three coaches would win at all cost and degraded what I did by making these boys, they were so tired they couldn't stay awake in class, running and touching poles, and was, was really making an accusation that I was one who would win at all costs. I remember coming into church Sunday morning and the pastor, he's with the Lord now, but he was a godly man, a good pastor. His name is M.L. Walters. I don't know if any of you ever heard of him. Not, probably not. But he, uh, he took me to his office and he said, Mike, what are you going to do about that article? And I said, I don't know, Pastor Walters. I, in fact, I, at that point, I hadn't even read the article. That's how much it impacted me. I didn't know anything about it. He said, I want to tell you something. And, and I'm telling you what, he was a godly man. But he said this, if you follow up a mule, I'll say it nicely, you will get kicked. And, uh, you know, if you give people ammo trying to defend yourself, they're just going to fire it back sometimes. Yeah. Paul was not going to commend, and, and, and I say all this, Paul was not going to commend himself again as an apostle to these people. His life, his ministry, the power of the gospel was evident there. And he wanted them for their conscience sake. We are not commending ourselves again to you, but we are giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. Sort of reminds us back to 1 Samuel, doesn't it? Man looketh on the outward appearance, but what? God looketh on the heart. It's the heart that is what, what is so important. But so many times in ministry, we worry about the outward appearance. God is concerned about the heart. Verse 13, he says, For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. His critics called him crazy. He was in good company. You know, they said the same thing about Jesus, right? They made the same accusations about John the Baptist. Paul says that if I am beside myself, it is for 
God. I believe without a doubt the Apostle Paul had such a passion for the gospel of Christ that to those who did not know the gospel and to those who opposed him, he probably looked crazy. He probably looked like he, this guy's lost his mind. But it was his passion. It was his passion that, that caused him to do those things that he did. You know, it doesn't give us details of what it was, but we, we, we know that the natural man does not understand the things of God. They are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them, neither can he know them. So as Paul stands before them and they think some of them accuse him of being insane, being crazy, he might look that way to them. But his passion drove him to serve Christ. Turn to, turn to Acts real quick. Turn to Acts chapter 26 with me real quick here. And as Paul was given his defense. Acts chapter 26. Look at me if you would at verse number 24. Acts 26 verse 24. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly, for I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice. For this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, notice where he goes with this. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether a short or long I would, notice his heart, notice his compassion. I would to God that not only you, but all who hear me this day might become such as I, except for these chains. It was his passion that drove him. And a motivating part of that fact, passion, we see in the, in the very next verse. Paul says, if I'm beside myself, it is for God. If I am in my right mind or sober-minded, it is for you. And then notice the third motivation. Verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us or controls us. When you think of that word, for the love of Christ, I do not believe in this context, I do not believe it was Paul's love for Christ. I believe it was, without a doubt, Christ's love for Paul. Please, please get that. It becomes man-centered versus God-centered. Is it wrong to love God? No. We love the Lord, right? We're commanded to love the Lord. But the only way we can love the Lord is because he first loved us. And when we understand that love, it will be a motivating force in our lives. The word constraineth, or I think here in, in the ESV, it talks about controls. It, it's, it's, it's a compression, and it's a compression that causes action. And, and I, I, I love the way the way the, the word works it out, that, you know, when, when you think about, I, I, for me, I think about water being compressed. And, and uh, water can do a lot of work. It can cause a lot of damage. Recent floods, you, 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 you've seen some of that. But, but it's a compression that causes action. It was the love of Christ. It was Christ's love on Paul's heart and in Paul's life that caused 
him to go forth. Romans 5.5 5 tells us that the love of God is what? Shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. On Wednesdays, I've had the opportunity to go back to the book of 1 John with a group. And, you know, you, you, you see that love so evident in the life of a true believer. In fact, John says, if you say you hate your brother, the truth is not in you. Yeah. We love him because why? He first love us. For God so loved the world. Friend, if you're here this morning and you do not know Christ as your Savior, I pray this morning you will understand the magnitude of that love. We sang about it in every song here this morning. That you would, you would come to grips with how much God loves you. And not just how much God loves you, but the impact of God's love in you. Because this is where Paul is talking about here. It's the love of Christ that controls us. And wow, I could probably spend the rest of the time here just finishing the last part of this verse. The love which controls us, the love of Christ which controls us, because we have concluded this, that one died for all. And then you see another therefore, right? Therefore, all have died. Think back to, um, this came up in a chapel service I did yesterday, but think back to the Old Testament times and, and all the sacrifices that was given for one. But yet we know in the, through the death of Christ, Christ died once to satisfy. If you want a good chapter to read, I don't have time to go here, but read chapter, Hebrews chapter 10. I mean, it, it, you'll see it without doubt. You'll see, if you're a child of God, you will see that Christ's death is sufficient. Christ died once. He did not die over and over. His death was sufficient. That's why we use the 50 cent word propitiation. I can't hardly say it, but his, his, his death was sufficient. So please, as Paul begins here, he makes it very clear that one died for all. Now, my next question, and please, as I go here, I am not here to cause division. Please understand this. If you do not know Christ as your Savior, if you receive Christ as your Savior, He, by faith, He will save you. Amen? Christ died for all. My question is, who is the all? If Christ died for all, then would not all be saved? If you believe that, then you're teaching universalism. You're saying that all people everywhere are, are, are saved. But notice where Paul is going here. And, and please, I, I, follow me closely. And uh, that's hard to do sometimes. He says, we have concluded this. One died for all. Christ died for us, right? Therefore... All have died. It didn't say, therefore, all were dead. You know, if he had said, then all were dead, we, we could understand that, right? All, Ephesians 2, 1, right? We were dead in trespasses and sin. But notice what Paul says here. Please, please, this, this should impact our lives tremendously. One died for all, therefore, this conclusion, right? Based upon Christ dying for all, therefore all have died. Paul is emphasizing here the substitutionary 
work of Christ. It is saturated throughout the scripture. One died for all, therefore all have died. If you are a child of God, when Christ paid for your sins, please follow me here, you died with Christ. He was our substitute. Go back. I'm going to take time for this one. Go back to Isaiah chapter 53. Talk about a passage that highlights the substitutionary work of Christ on our behalf. Isaiah chapter 53. Notice verse 4. And if you will, I'll just, just, I'm just going to skip through this whole chapter here. Just go back and read the whole chapter. But for time's sake, let me just hit a couple passages. Surely he has borne whose griefs? Our griefs. He has carried whose sorrows? Our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his wounds, we are healed. All we are like sheep and have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Verse 10, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteousness. He shall bear their iniquities. Verse 12 at the end, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercessions for their transgressions. Jesus Christ was our substitute. Who is he the substitute for? He's the substitute for those who believe by faith. By faith. It's the power of the gospel in which Jesus Christ died for our sins. New Testament, same, same principle. Go to Romans. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only... That, but we rejoice in the sufferings, knowing that the suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because the, God's love, that love of God, has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for whom? The ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died. Who? For who? For us. He was our substitute. As the conclusion of this passage will say, it was God who placed... Christ on the cross to pay the price for our sins that we might be reconciled to him. 
Christ is our substitute. And when he died on the cross, beloved, we died there with him. He paid that price so that we could have life, eternal life, an abundant life that brings honor and glory to his name. I don't think I ever preach a passage of scripture in which I don't make some reference in some shape or form to Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, what? I live. Yet not I, but it's Christ that lives in me. In the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I was crucified with Christ. My sins were paid for. He paid for my sins. When Christ died, I hope you have this, when Christ died, you died. You died. Buried in his baptism, raised to walk in what? Newness of life. Paul says it very well in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3. For you have died and your life is hidden. Oh, this is beautiful, isn't it, the picture? Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Jesus Christ was our substitute. One died for all. And I think this, this limits, this part here limits it that his substitutionary death are for those who have died. Therefore all have died in him. As a result of that, all the, the sacrificial life, and he died for all, verse 15, and I got to hurry, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll finish up here. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves. I'll say that again, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. You see the reasons for the therefores? I mean, it, it is so progressive through the text here. And one of the last things that I want to get to, motivating factors, is, you know, one of the motivating factors was the fact that Christ changes lives. Isn't it wonderful to see how Christ changes the lives of those who understand and those who, by faith, Accept his substitutionary death for them? Let me tell you, God is, is so gracious to us, isn't he? He allows men to hear the gospel still. Yeah. There's common grace that all people enjoy, right? Right? Matthew 5, it rains on the just and the unjust. You can tell I've been involved in flood duty here lately. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, but, but God's grace is, is common. 1 Timothy 4, you know, that creatively, you know, Christ is the Savior of all men, but especially those who, what? Believe by faith. They put their trust and faith in him. We see clearly that he died and because of his death, he changes lives, which comes to our final. I could have preached this on the four therefores, but this comes to our final therefore. Therefore, what's the therefore? I hope you've asked yourself this every time. What's the therefore, therefore? Go back to verse 16. We regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, 
we regard him thus no longer. You know, there was a time in Paul's life where he just regarded Christ in the flesh. But something happened. What happened? The Damascus Road, right? The Damascus Road completely changed Paul's perspective of Christ. He wasn't opposition any longer. He was Lord. Lord, what will thou have me to do? He was changed immediately. His life was, was never the same. So therefore, verse 17, if anyone is, what a beautiful phrase. Man, we could spend forever here. Therefore, if anyone is, what? In Christ. He is a new creation. The old passed away. Behold, the new has come. That is only by the power of Christ. Christ, please, Christ is the only one who changes a person's life. It is not self-discipline. It is not conforming to rules. It is not keeping the top five. Christ is the only one that changes the heart. If anyone is in Christ, buried with him in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection, he is a new creation. Things change. You want a motivating factor? It's the power of the gospel. It's the power of the gospel. Last week, Lisa, and, well, maybe two weeks ago, Lisa and I had the opportunity to have dinner with a family. A man had just recently trusted Christ. And uh, as, as we were going out back to our car, Lisa turned and looked at me and she said, isn't it wonderful to see? He's, that guy's a, a different guy. Amen. And uh, you know, it, isn't it wonderful to see? doesn't mean that we're sinless. That's not the case. But let me tell you what. Christ will change your life. For me to live, Paul says, Christ to die? Gain. We live our lives for the furtherance of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, for his honor and his glory. I pray as you go throughout this month that God will use these motivations to stir your heart to stir your life. To live your lives to bring honor and glory to the King of kings and the Lord of lords who honor and glory belongs forever and ever and ever. And all the Lord's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and Lord, we praise you this morning for the power of the gospel. Lord, I do not know each heart here, but you do. And I pray today that if there would be one here who has never understood the magnitude of your love for them, I pray today that they would see that that you loved them enough that you went to the cross and there you who knew no sin became sin for us in order that we might have your righteousness. What a great exchange. Father, I pray that today they would see that love. 
draw them to thyself, I pray. Lord, for those who are here who are your children, I pray that our hearts and our minds would be stirred with the fact that when you died, we died with you. That we are no longer to live for ourselves, but we are to live for your honor and your glory. God, I pray that you will constantly remind me of that fact. Lord, I rest in such satisfaction that you died once to provide that salvation for us. Father, we pray that as the month continues throughout, that you will just use your servants mightily for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray.